Tell me about life in El Paso and about your family. Well, I was the only one at home with my parents, my brother being 12 and a half years older. And I had already gone off to college and started his life and got married and had kids and so on. So I was reared really like an only child, right, which right. wasn't a lot of fun, but that's how it was. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about your dad. My father was born in Lithuania, a city called Mariupol. He was one of eight siblings. However, his twin brother, Ben, was killed. And we don't know much about it because nobody talked about it. Mm. So we think it was either right at the beginning of World War I or during a pogrom. But we do not know. My father would not talk about it. My mother did not want me asking my father questions. So he was the last of all the children and they all came to the U.S. previous to him and his mother. And he and his mother came to New York in 1920, and they came through Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. And then they settled in El Paso, where my father's oldest brother, Sam Bellman, had settled and had actually brought out all the other members of the family. My father was a very easygoing uh, man, enjoyed a good laugh, enjoyed his children. He was not intellectual. And he and my uncle, my mother's brother, had a business across the state line in New Mexico called the Bellman Mercantile. And so that's where he worked until he retired and then lived in El Paso until his death at the age of 78. Did, um, did he ever tell you why El Paso? What happened was his oldest brother, Sam, came to the U.S. I think it must have been around the early 1900s. And Sam came through Galveston. And the reason he settled in El Paso was he had a cousin in New Mexico. He worked in his cousin's store in the same little town, La Mesa, New Mexico, where my father and my uncle uh, settled their store. And so the whole family came through El Paso and one brother, Charlie, went to Chicago, and two brothers, Lamar and Alex, went to Arizona. And actually, my father's two sisters went to Arizona, too. Did um, your dad ever say what it was like coming to this country? He never talked about it. He did tell me that in Lithuania, he enjoyed riding horses. Mm -hmm. His mother owned some kind of um, eating establishment, but he always said that his brother Sam, who was actually, I think, maybe 12, 16 years older than he was, was like a father to him mm -hmm. because his father, my father's father, David Bellman, after whom I am named, actually, died when my father was just a baby. Ah. So he never knew him. Did they ever say anything about why they came to America? Well, things were bad in Europe. And I think my, fa my father and his mother came after World War I right. because things were so bad in Europe, and they already had family in the States. Yeah, so yeah. why remain there? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about your mom. My mother was born in a town in Lithuania called Pilvishki. Mm -hmm. She was one of five children. Her father was a school principal. His name was also Samuel. And now I've got a grandson named Samuel. So that's a good, solid family name. 
Samuel had five kids with my grandmother, Yoke Heaven, but Samuel Levinson was the name, actually died at a young age too. And my mother's two older brothers, Saul and Max, had come to the United States and again settled in Texas. So then my aunt, my mother's only sister, wanted to come to the States too, and she came and lived with Saul. Then my mother, Bessie Bellman, Bessie Levinson right, at right. that time, and her younger brother, Mo Levinson, and the mother were uh, remaining in Pilvishki. So they got caught in World War I, and it was a very, very bad time. Mm. And they came to the States in 1920, my grandmother, my mother, and my uncle came to the States after the war. But my uncle, my oldest uncle, Saul, had settled in El Paso, and he was nice enough to have sent them first-class tickets. Wow. So they yeah. did not have to go through Ellis Island. They were examined, I don't know, either on the ship or when they got off it, off they went. Hmm. They went straight to Minnesota, where my grandmother's brother had settled in the late, I think, 1870s. Wow. But uh, they didn't stay there. They just visited and came down to El Paso, where my uncle Saul had settled. Yeah. Now, your folks met in El Paso then? Yes, they did. Their mothers. My grandmother, Yochevit, my mother's mother, and my grandmother, Rachel, my father's mother, became friends. Yeah. So yeah. the two of them met that way. Yeah, yeah. Was it an arranged marriage? I don't know. My mother came from a family of rabbis and scholars. Her grandfather, who lived to the age of almost 100, was a rabbi in that little town of Pilvishki. He was a very impressive man. His wife had died early, and then he lived with my mother and her mother and her younger brother. Now, during the war, the Russians would come through, the Germans would come through. At that time, remember that was uh, before the Nazi period. My mother said the Germans were very refined, very elegant. They would apportion a house or appropriate a house for their officers, but treated everybody very well. Now, when the Russians came through, that was not the case. They were more coarse. They were more bullyish. And one time, my mother said, her elderly grandfather, who must have been about 96 at the time, saved her from the clutches of some Russian who came into the house and said, oh, that's a pretty young girl there. My mother was like, what, 14, 15? So my grandfather came, stood in front of my mother, now 96 years old, or somewhere thereabout, and said, don't you touch this girl. And he backed off. So she felt like her grandfather was her savior. Right, right, right. He had gotten very ill at the age of 90, and everybody thought he was going to die. They were saying the last prayers. He took a turn for the better and lived 10 more years. Wow. So he was there in the house during the war and helped my mother. Yeah. Then after the war around 1918, he said, that's enough. I've lived enough. And he died. And then my mother's wow. mother, 
you know, it took a while to settle the business and all mm -hmm. that. She sold everything and they came to New York. My grandmother, Yo Heaven, did not want to leave Lithuania as long as her elderly father was still living. And they couldn't bring him to the States. Right. He was too old, too frail. So they waited till 1920 and uh, settled everything and came. Now, did your mom ever talk about the trip? A lot. She said that she was very sorry to, live, to leave Lithuania. She liked Lithuania. Well, that's but all that she knew. that was before the war. Mm -hmm. During the war, it was so bad that they were glad to leave. She remembers how pretty Lithuania was compared to El Paso. She said, riding on the train, coming from, I suppose, from Minnesota to El Paso, she was very sad and wrote it all down hmm. about how she missed Lithuania, the beauty of it, and um, how she didn't like the desert. She never did like desert environment. Yeah, yeah. Did she say anything about the adjustment to make from one country to the next? You know, a different I, language? You would think so, but right away both my mother and my father went to English classes mm. in a Catholic school, I believe. I mean, that was first order of business. Mm -hmm. And they both learned to speak English correctly with an accent, of course. Mm -hmm. And they both spoke Yiddish fluently at home, but they spoke English grammatically correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did, when did you meet Jerry? I met Jerry at the University of Texas in 1959. I had transferred from the University of Texas at El Paso and uh, spent my last two years at UT. Mm -hmm. And then, did you guys get married after you graduated? We got married about five years after we met. Okay. So it was after we graduated. Yes. Okay. So after you graduated then, you weren't getting married. Uh, where did you go? I went back to El Paso and taught for two years, taught English in high school. And where was Jerry now? He was in um, Austin for one year and then Dallas. Okay. Okay. And then how did you guys reconnect? Or did you always stay in touch? He continued to write to me. Right. And one day he sent me a letter and said, you know, this is ridiculous. Either we've got something going or we don't. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. Why don't you join me out at Yellowstone Park where I'm going to be a ranger for the summer and you can, I'll get you a job there. I said, sure. So I did. Now, meantime, I had gone to Europe. I had gone to El Paso to teach and live at home so I could buy a car and then go to Europe. Yeah, yeah. So I spent the summer of, um, I guess it was 61, traveling in Europe with a group and then with some friends. Where did you go? All over Western Europe and then to the British Isles. Yeah, yeah. Loved it. So then came back, I had a bill to pay for my trip, and taught another year. And then I went off to graduate school in Ohio. Wow. And um, was doing a master's degree in English. Where was at this? Ohio State. Ohio State, okay. And that was where I was when Jerry wrote me. Well, the master's degree in English did not suit me. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. So when he said, come on to Yellowstone's Park with me and we'll see what's what, I was glad to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did you guys get married? We got married in December of 63 and then moved to Dallas the end of December of 63. Now, was he in the service at this time? No. He had been in the service okay. previous to going to UT Austin. Okay. And that was one reason I liked him because um, 
he was just more mature, mm -hmm. more interesting mm -hmm. than these 19-year-olds I yeah. had been dating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you settled down in Dallas. What did you guys do? Did you stay at, stay at I, home or did you um, also work? I taught at Ursuline Academy okay. for one year. Then I had my twin daughters, mm -hmm. and I didn't teach other than Temple Emmanuel Hebrew School and Sunday School until they went to first grade. Mm -hmm. Then I got a job teaching special ed at R.L. Turner in Carrollton. Mm -hmm. Taught there for two years, didn't want to do that anymore. Had my last child, a son, born in July of 73. And two weeks later, enrolled in a master's degree program at TWU in counseling psychology. I had originally planned to get a master's in special ed with a degree in diagnostic education. But once I, taught, I took my first psychology course, I thought, I love it. I want this. So I got a degree in marriage and family therapy at TWU, graduated in 1977, went to work for a couple of agencies, and eventually started my own practice, which is where I am now. Yeah, yeah. Is there something in family counseling, is there like the common thing that you see all the time? that couples do not talk to each other very nicely. They use bad language, they label each other, they call each other names. Jerry and I talk to each other nicely 99% mm -hmm. of the time. <laughs> That's very good. Happiest time in your life? I think when I had my kids. Yeah. Although when I had my daughters, we went from two incomes and no children to one income and two children. Right. So that was very hard. Right. Being the wife of a school teacher who is not working, that is no fun. I don't recommend that to anybody. Yeah. But you made it through. We made it through. Yeah. Yeah. And then once I went back to work, things were on the upswing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the most rewarding aspect of your career for you? You're dealing with people, and it's a very personal thing, obviously, for them. Yes, it is. The most rewarding, I think, is seeing them improve. Yeah. I have had clients that I had no hope for whatsoever. I don't tell them this, right, right. but I think there's no way you two are going to make it. The next thing I know, they're doing better. Yeah. So that's very rewarding. Now, in your lifetime, you've lived through so many remarkable events. I did march at San Clemente. Tell me about against that. Against the war. We were in California visiting my brother and my brother-in-law. And my sister-in-law, Marie Caston, said, well, there's going to be a rally and a march. And this is the Vietnam War you're talking about. Vietnam War. I said, I'm in. So we went and we marched at San Clemente. During the march, did you guys feel empowered? Did you, were you nervous? Were you afraid? Were the police there? Yeah, were I nervous. Wasn't afraid. Did I feel empowered? Probably not. But you felt like you had to do something. Yeah, it was a very turbulent time in this yes. country, you know. And, and so did you do more? Or was that? You know, that was it. That was it. That was the only march. Yeah, yeah. And what did Jerry, how did Jerry feel about the Vietnam War since he was in the service right at the end of the Korean War? He felt the same way, but he didn't march because he was taking care of our twin daughters. <laughs> so we were at the beach, yeah. and I said, Jerry, I want to go march. Yeah. What yeah. do I do with Jenny and Ruth? He yeah. said, okay, I'll keep them. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you and Jerry have the three kids and five grandkids. Yes. What advice does Grandma have for the next generation? What advice? Well, Judaism is very important to me. I would like to see all my children and grandchildren feel strongly about maintaining Judaism, mm -hmm. however they do it. I was raised as a um, 
mm, semi-Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. I am now Reform. I am not Orthodox mm -hmm. at all. But I'm very passionate about Judaism.